The Hearts of Gold podcast is brought to you by the Grow and Share Network, produced by Off the Walter Media Productions. Welcome to Hearts of Gold. Today we have Shristi with us. Hi. Hi. Can you tell us about your Girl Scout Gold Award project? Sure. So for my project, I created an improved organ donation education toolkit in partnership with Gift of Life Michigan. So that's the organ procurement organization for the state of Michigan. And with uh, this organization, I I was able to create an improved toolkit that will be distributed to driver's education schools throughout our state. And uh, I was able to actually make an impact on the 84,000 students that take driver's ed yearly in our state by providing them with increased knowledge of organ donation. So the toolkit includes a student letter, a parent letter, a driver's ed teacher flyer, an online Kahoot quiz, and an informative flyer. I also was able to sign up more than 150 people on the organ donor registry at Troy High alone and in our like surrounding community. Um, I was also able to you know, foster effective organ donation education among the Troy High community, which was able to potentially benefit um, 1,200 lives since one organ donor can save eight lives. I know one piece of your project is that you did a high school challenge in order to have signups. Can you tell us about that? So my project, I'd like to say that like it was kind of in two different parts. So like the first part was with my the toolkit that I created, which was kind of like the larger part. And then the second part was um, like me reaching out and like having one on one conversations with people in my community. And the challenge that you were just talking about is a part of that. So Gift of Life Michigan, um, in an attempt to get more people, more younger people actually involved in organ donation, which is the goal of my project, um, they wanted to reach out to high school specifically. And um, they did this uh, challenge in like more of a competitive environment so that it would allow students to like really, you know, want to participate because we were the I think the prize was a pizza party and there was a whole bunch of other things that we could get if our school won. So that was able to, you know, get a lot of people passionate about organ donation. And it even though we out of 26 schools, we placed fourth. So even though we didn't get the official prize, it was still really nice to see how, you know, so many people were really passionate about organ donation just as much as I was after, which I can get into like why I was passionate about it right now. So (laughs) um, when I was in eighth grade, my English teacher was actually waiting for um, a kidney transplant for like a really long time. Um, I think when she actually ended up receiving it later on, uh, I think she had been waiting for around three to four years, which is a really long time to have to change your entire schedule around this one thing in your life. And so she used to talk a lot about how hard it was to not to be waiting for an organ transplant for years and years. And I really came to understand like how no one was really talking about this issue at all. And when I did some research on it, I found out that Uh, Over 120,000 people in our country alone are currently waiting for a life-saving transplant, and then 22 people um, each day pass away when an organ does not become available for them. And I realized that, like, even though nobody really knows about it, organ donation is one of those things where literally every single person has the power to change that, and it will literally take, like, two minutes at most to change someone's life. It's like something really beautiful in that like you can literally not even do anything that, you know, significant, but you can actually make a significant change on somebody's life. I started to really get involved in like the organ donation community. I started volunteering with Gift of Life Michigan. I started a club at my school. But when like the Gold Gold Award started to come along, I was really like trying really hard to think of a topic for my gold award and it almost became kind of a struggle for me because I think I was trying like too hard to think of a topic. Like I was just like trying to brainstorm all these ideas, which is not the idea of like 
ideal situation to be in. So I realized that like I already had a really big passion for something in my community. So I decided that I would like use that as a stepping stone to even like make my impact like even better. And so for that, I came to the idea of creating like a toolkit for drivers at school specifically because um, when I started doing like driver's ed classes just for my own like license and everything, I realized that like organ donation was barely talked about like at all, even in driver's ed classes, because after drive, I don't know if anyone really knows this, but once you go to the secretary of state or DMV to get your license, there's going to be a question that you'll be asked. And that's like, would you like to be added to the organ donor registry? And that happens everywhere, not just in Michigan. It's, you know, like countrywide where people need to decide if they want to become an organ donor. And a lot of people check no because they don't really know what it is. And there's so many myths about it, which is a big part of my project, just dispelling those myths. And so, yeah, so I realized that, like, I really wanted to target the teen demographic because that's the youth is like very important in targeting them just because they have the power to change everything. Chances are if, you know, a teenager or, or a child finds out about organ donation and knows like the truths and how you can pretty much become a hero through that, they're more likely to talk to their parents, their grandparents, you know. So that's really where my project came from. And along those same lines, in addition to not just talking to their parents and grandparents about becoming organ donors themselves, there is a conversation that's important for organ donors to have so that others know that those are their wishes. I'm sure that that was a part of your project. Can you share your thoughts about that? What I like to talk about sometimes when I'm talking about organ donation is that I went kind of viral, I guess, like a couple years ago, but Selena Gomez actually got an organ transplant from her best friend. And that is called living donation. But the one that I was mainly focused on is after you pass away and then giving your organs to someone else who will be able to have a second chance at life. Right? So a lot of people um, that's going back to all the myths that I was talking about, about how, you know, people are like neglect to have this conversation because it's very taboo. And another thing that I'd like that, um, like I've seen through videos of, you know, parents sharing stories of their kids being donors and things like that is that, you know, if they were put in a situation where their child or, you know, one of their loved ones, you know, unfortunately lost their life because there was no organ transplant, you know, they would be devastated. There are situations where their child passes away because of other reasons. They know that um, they are so, like, they really want to have their child be an organ donor because they know how that will feel if they were ever put in a position where, a, ch a child lost their life because they didn't have an organ transplant. I think that it's really important when we're having this conversation about organ donation is just trying to put yourself in someone else's shoes and thinking about like, if this were to happen to you, you'd want, you know, someone to be there to give your loved one a second chance at life. What was your biggest challenge during your project? Most people really want to help you. Like they, there'll be like very rare occasions where people will be like, no, I don't want to help you. Most people want to help you and want to see you succeed. If you're passionate about something, then that kind of radiates outwards. Like everyone else will be passionate about something if you show pass passion for it and you show that it's something worth being talked about, right? The reason why that I wanted to, you know, improve the current, the toolkit that was in driver's ed schools before is because it hadn't been improved in like around eight to 10 years. So I was like, first of all, even though this information is still good, it's not as recent as it should be. So I decided that, you know, it was important for, for this toolkit to be improved upon so that, you know, it would be able to target a certain demographic better. But what happened is that when I started surveying um, drivers at schools, it was very difficult for me to get a whole bunch of responses uh, compared to, you know, how many people that I wanted to reach. 
But what I learned from that is that when I first was trying to, you know, contact the drivers at schools, I was very much like writing up these emails and being like, please fill out the survey. It will be a big help for me and things like that. But what I realized is that people really want to see a personal connection with your project. So after that, I decided to start calling, you know, the drivers at schools personally and saying, hey, I'm really passionate about this. I, used, I said why I'm passionate about it, why it's something worth being talked about. And after that, I realized that so, so many, I got like way more responses after that because people were like, you know, she's super passionate about it. So they're more likely to help you. What was your favorite memory from your project? When I was, you know, one-on-one -on -one with someone talking about organ donation, as much as I love how many people I was able to impact, you know, through the toolkit I created, a lot of what I was doing with the toolkit and my main part of my project, I, I could say, is that like it was very much um, a lot of things that I was like doing on my computer and like creating all these documents, making them look you know, good and like really putting my like blood, sweat and tears into like making this amazing like toolkit that I really wanted for future students to have. But the most important part of my project that was like late in my project journey, I'd say, is just being able to see people's like thoughts kind of turn when I started dispelling these myths. Like one of the biggest myths is that, you know, you have to be an adult to be an organ donor, which is not true. Uh, in some ways it is true in that like if, if say for example, um, like unfortunately there's a child who registered themselves on their, the organ donor registry when they were 16, but for some reason they sadly pass away. Their parents, if they really don't want their child to be an organ donor, can, you know, like almost like rescind that decision and say, hey, I'm sorry, but I don't want my child to be an organ donor. But once you're 18 and above, if you said, hey, I want to be an organ donor when I pass away, no one can override that decision because you were, you know, old enough to decide and things like that. But, um, you know, when it's with someone under 18, one of the things is that they think that, oh, okay, like my parents will be involved and things like that, which is true to some extent, but also I think it's important in that age, you're really starting to like find yourself and things like that. And a lot of people, there are some, in some ways that, you know, want to, they want to be themselves and have their own life, but also they know that like, there are some things that parents have to, you know, override. So when I was talking to these students, I was really showing them how, yes, like your parents will be involved, but you also have the power yourself to change someone's life. And um, like the main, you know, course of action that I was taking is, hey, like when I was sitting at these tables in the media center of my school talking about organ donation to people, I was saying like, hey, you can sign up on the organ donor registry. Make sure you talk to your parents about it, though, because, you know, they can still say, hey, I don't want my like son or daughter to be an organ donor, which is totally OK, because that's their wish. And, you know, you, we, as long as you provide people with the information, I think that's the goal. It's not really about like how many people are actually signing up. The goal is for people to take the information you give them really think about it and decide if that's the best course of action for them. If they say, no, I'm sorry, I don't want to be an organ donor, you know, that's still great because at least they know about organ donation. That's the whole goal. And it's amazing if they end up saying, hey, I want to be an organ donor. But obviously that's not really the goal here. The goal is to equip the public with information. Along those lines, you are a health equity high school ambassador. Can you tell us about that? When I was in my sophomore year of high school, I attended um, a health equity summit. This is at the University of Michigan. And essentially what they do is try to reach out to um, high schools about what health equity and public health really is. And the reason why it struck with me is that, you know, at the same time, I was still working on my Gold Award project and things like that. The same goal was there in that they were trying to get to students who weren't really taught about health equity and public health because that's completely absent from our school curriculum. We learn about like biology, 
we learn about like psychology, things like that, but we never learn about health disparities. We don't learn about things that uh, marginalized communities face every day because I personally go to a fairly well-off school district and, you know, these things aren't faced by a lot of students, so they don't really know about it. And I want to learn more about these things because that's just a personal interest of mine. And I'm so honored that I was able to be selected as an ambassador because that means that now I can like talk to, you know, my peers about this topic. And I'm so happy that it, it's, I'm able to reach out to communities and to people who don't know about this. So what are a couple of bullets that you learned from being an ambassador that would be important to share? Telling your truth. Unfortunately, this year it was canceled because of what's going on in our country with coronavirus and everything. But um, one of the main activities of the summit was essentially where they'd ask all these questions about what, you know, marginalized communities face. So some of the questions would be like, have you ever feared getting deported? Like really serious topics. Have, has you or your family ever been denied medical care? Things that people, you know, fear in their daily lives, but is very taboo. What we were able to do is that people would say yes or no to all these like really serious uh, topics. We pass it around to someone else. So it's like an anonymous thing where essentially someone would get the paper of someone else's, you know, information and we'd ask the question and say, hey, has anyone ever had serious mental illness problems or something like that? And <clears throat> there'd be some people who would stand up. And it was a really great way to see these issues that other people were going through without actually like outing them because it was all anonymous. And I think that was really powerful because you were really able to see these issues that, you know, so many people go through, but they people don't really talk. So I think that was probably like the best thing that I like that I saw when I was there. And also it was just a lot of um, learning new things. I'd say it's very cliche, but we don't really talk about health equity or public health in schools. And it's only when you go to college when you find that out. And I think it was really interesting to see that. Another piece of health that you're involved in is that you go to the hospital, and, or at least you used to go to the hospital, <laughs> and play the, the violin for patients. Can you tell us about that? I really want to go to the into the medical field in the future, just because what I've been doing with my gold award, you know, like a lot of the activities that I've done have really shown me that like I love this field for a variety of different reasons. But specifically with <clears throat> what I've been doing in the hospital, is through volunteering and community service in general, there's a lot of, I guess in our generation, there's a lot of like, go to a third world country and help out or like really big, wonderful things that people are doing. And a lot of people are just saying, people are doing these great things, what can I do that will help? And with this, that uh, with playing violin to patients, which is what I do at the hospital, I realized that even for two minutes helping someone, it still feels great as much as like as happy as you'd feel helping someone in like a third world country. You still feel that when you help someone for maybe like five minutes by playing, you know, a piece of music to them. So that's what I've learned, you know, through playing my violin to patients. And another artistic involvement you have is dance. Can you tell us about your dance? I've always been, I guess, a really like artistic person. I really liked, you know, playing with music and dancing. When I was about like five or six, my uh, parents put me in Indian classical dance. So that's basically like, it's not exactly like modern Indian, like Bollywood dance that you'd see in like movies and things like that. It's very much like dancing that has traditionally been done by, you know, older generations. And even though I guess I'm not always like the best dancer, I think the thing that, I, that was really important to me about, you know, doing Bharatanatyam, which is what it's called, Indian classical dance, um, is like I was able to really get more in touch with like my culture and where my parents are from and things like that. But also 
thing that I'm the most proud of is, you know, what I've been able to do with organ donation. I think that like dancing, um, like it allowed me to have like, a stepping stone into other things that I love. And like a lot of what I like now is, you know, playing music and things like that. And I think starting dance so young was able to, you know, truly solidify my love for playing the violin and, you know, eventually joining um, like my school's um, dance club and, you know, joining my school's orchestra program. So I think that, that was, that's like a really important part of who I am. And it's really allowed me to, you know, find other passions. So you mentioned that you're planning on going to medical school. Do you have a path that you're considering? Right now, I'm not really sure like what type of doctor I want to be, but mental health maybe, or um, like pediatrics, because I really like reaching out to children and also talking about things that are like very taboo and not really talked about through my gold award. So yeah, maybe somewhere around there in that like intersection, but I'm not really sure right now. You have also earned your silver and your bronze award. What were your projects for those? So my silver award was essentially a way to get middle school, uh, incoming middle schoolers more uh, immersed, I guess, in the community. So something that I found when I went to middle school is that it was very hard to figure out what middle school truly was like. And it's a big change. Even though like high school is an even bigger change, at that time, your your mind is very much like focused on what's ahead of you. And you're like, okay, middle school is like the biggest change ever. And you're really worried about that. And even though it seems kind of naive, it's an actual like big problem that, you know, fifth graders face. So what I wanted to do is kind of allow um, these incoming sixth graders to really understand what their middle school was all about. So I created a welcome packet where I talked about like the bell schedule, the lunch schedules, you know, help with how to open lockers, which was a big deal for me in like fifth grade. So I did a lot of that kind of stuff to allow people to like, and it's, it was a lot, a lot of it was mainly for like the students, but also it helped the parents a little, I guess, because I think that it really showed parents as well, what Baker Middle School, which is the middle school I, you know, implemented this uh, toolkit or like packet in, and it allowed them to like, you know, their anxieties, like, just like say, it's going to be okay. Like, here's, you need to know, but just like, you'll figure it out. Kind of, that's kind of what my goal was to show them. And even now, like the packets are still being distributed by the teachers at my elementary school, which is really nice. And then for my bronze award, this was a really long time ago, but I remember when I was in like third or fourth grade, I think it was, my troop and I were, we realized that while walking around our playground, we wanted to create like a dog waste sanitation station because dog waste wasn't being picked up. And we realized that You know, we want to keep our playground and our school clean and we want to make sure that everyone felt like comfortable going and playing there. And so what we did is we created a, or we ordered, I guess you could say, like a dog waste sanitation station where there was bags for dog owners to go pick up the dog waste and put it, um, you know, get it out of the way. And we realized that the reason why we did that is because It wasn't that like the dog owners, I guess, just didn't want to do it, but we realized that show them that we were trying to help them with that too. So they, when they see like the bags that are already there, you know, it makes it a lot easier for them to say, Hey, all you have to do is pick it up and put it away. That's it. So I think my bronze award was kind of when I realized really young that I wanted to you know, continue Girl Scouts until like 12th grade and then eventually go for my gold award. But I think like being being able to say that like I finished the bronze, the silver and the gold award is really satisfying. So I definitely suggest like any really young Girl Scouts to go for your bronze because that will allow you to show that you really love, love Girl Scouting. If you're able to do a bronze award when you're so young, 
you know that you have it in you to go for your bronze. I mean, go for your silver and then for your gold award. So yeah, I'd really suggest a lot of people to do all three awards, even though it doesn't really happen that often. I definitely suggest it. Along those lines, how do you see that the bronze gave you skills for your silver and the silver for your gold? So I think just the way that the awards are set up, you know, really allows you to understand what each um, award specifically is like and then what the future awards will be like. Like, um, I know that the silver award wanted 50 hours, I believe. And then I think the bronze was like 20 hours. There's a progression in the awards because each one requires more and more time. Each one, it first starts off as like a troop thing. Then it starts out with like a partner, like, or you could do it by yourself like I did. And then the gold award is like the final one that's just you on your own. And even though you can still do your gold award without the bronze or the silver, I really think that if you do the bronze and the silver, I think you're more likely to end up going for gold because you, first of all, you've already done two out of the three and you already have experience carrying out a plan like that. So you kind of know what you're doing and just in Girl Scouts in general has done a really good job of setting it up like that. And um, I don't really think that it's that much about how hard it is or like what you need to do to get there. I think just knowing that you've already done the bronze or that you've already done the silver and then there's only one more left. I think that's very much an incentive to go for the next step because you're already almost at the finish line anyways, right? Is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience? A lot of people are skeptical to like go for the gold award because it's a lot of work. And, you know, I understand that, but I really think that at this point, like if you've dedicated all of this time and effort to Girl Scouting, I think it's very much worth it to go for the gold for anyone. If you've made it this far in Girl Scouts, you have it in you to go for the gold award. In like ninth and 10th grade, they're really thinking about getting adjusted to high school and maybe doing like sports or other things. And then 11th grade, it's very much like preparing for college and like taking um, like standardized tests. And then once you get to 12th grade, you're like, oh, I'm going to college soon anyways. Like, I don't really have the time for that. But I really suggest that once you finish your silver award or once you're going from a cadet to a senior, you should really start to plan or start thinking about like what you want to do for a gold award. Because if you plan early on, you'll be done before high school gets really crazy. Like for example, right now I'm a junior. Well, I just finished my junior year. I'm going into my senior year. So I'm really glad that I was able to, you know, really finish my gold award and have it with me because my ceremony was just like a week ago. And I was able to, you know, have the award and I can really like talk about it when I apply to college. And it allowed me to really figure out what I wanted to do in college. Another thing that I'd like to say is don't think of the gold award as something like you just need to get done. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that's what a lot of people think about it. They're like, oh, I want to go through Girl Scouts so I can just get the gold award and like get it over with. But I think that's something that's important about it is that the more time and energy you put into your gold award, the more you're going to change as a person and the more of like a positive effect it will have on who you are and how it might even like help you decide what you want to do with your future. So I really think that planning it out well so that you can get the most out of it is really vital. How do you make your s'mores? I'm not really that unique in my s'mores, but, um, you know, I just do the normal thing. But one thing that I tried recently, obviously before everything happened and I was having to be quarantined and everything, but I remember recently I tried s'mores with like the cookies and cream chocolate instead of the regular chocolate. It was like really good. So definitely suggest that. Well, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Please make sure to hit subscribe so you always know when new episodes are released. And don't forget to power your passion and conquer your challenges. The Hearts of Gold podcast is brought to you by the Grow and Share Network, produced by Off the Walter Media Productions. Thank you for listening and spreading the word on what we do. If you want to share your story of how you earned your gold award, reach out and send an email to growandshare at outlook.com. 
Be sure to listen to the newest episodes on your favorite podcast app, as well as view the full video episodes on youtube.com slash Cheryl M. Robinson. That's youtube.com slash Cheryl, the letter M, Robinson. Take care, and we'll see you next time.